This program is made possible in part by the Maryland Arts Council through the State of Maryland and the National Endowment for the Arts and the Howard County Arts Council through a grant from Howard County Government. Hello and welcome to Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. My name is Terrence Wench and it's uh, uh, my pleasure today to uh, introduce novelist extraordinaire Colin McCann who was last on The Writing Life in 1998 when he was a young writer of conspicuous talent and vision. Now in 2013 it's a safe bet to call him one of the world's leading writers in the English language. In no small way that stature was earned through the success of his last book 2009's Let the Great World Spin, a virtuosic, multi-layered novel that won a long list of awards, most notably from an American perspective, the National Book Award. Colm, welcome to The Writing Life. Thank you so much. Fifteen years. Fifteen years. My God. It's a long time. It flies. Uh, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but um, uh, as the literary world and, and the two of us well know, Philip Roth, the great American novelist, announced his retirement from mm -hmm from fiction, uh, I think it was last fall. Right. Uh, um, and it, some interesting things in, uh, in the press uh, that he said when he announced this. He said, I decided I was finished with fiction. I don't want to read it. I don't want to write it. I don't even want to talk about it anymore. Mm. I dedicated my life to the novel. I studied them, I taught them, I wrote them, and I read them at the exclusion of nearly everything else. It's enough. I'm not responsible for my life and for mining it anymore. You know, I needed my life as a springboard for my fiction. I have to have something solid under my feet when I write. I'm not a fantasist. I bounce up and down on the diving board and I go into the water of fiction. But I've got to begin in life so I can pump life into it throughout. Mm -hmm. And when I read that, I actually thought of you because we've discussed before, you know, how different your method is from that, right. from, from using one's uh, uh, own biography as, a, as the as the content and, and inspiration for right. fiction. And um, I, I, I'd, I'd like to hear more from you on, on that subject, on, on how your, your books take root, on whether or not it's, it would be conceivable to you to ever write, say, an autobiographical novel. Hmm. Is that like off the, off the table for you? Or, or you know, how, how do you feel about someone like Roth? And, uh, well, I, I, I like everybody else's diving board, and I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to jump off into the pool uh, from, from dozens of different diving boards, including Philip Roth's, but I don't really have a diving board um, of my own. So, uh, in fact, only recently, um, I've written um, eight books now, and uh, only recently I wrote about Dublin for the first time, and I was born, raised in suburban Dublin. I believe in the... The, the poetry of the other, if you will. Mm -hmm. So in, in making that leap into someone else's skin, what, what uh, Dylan Thomas would have called uh, sort of adventures in the skin trade, right. uh, becoming uh, somebody completely different than yourself. I mean, I live with myself 24 hours a day, as Roth is saying, he minds himself. Uh, and, but, but my mind uh, is, is in getting into, some, into somebody else's skin, and that's where I sort of enjoy it. It, it becomes a form of travel for me. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, a form of adventure to try and figure out uh, what everybody else is like um, and I wouldn't I've never really written um, about myself and I don't really look forward to the idea of being so sort of diseased with self-consciousness that's my own personal uh, would you take. ever write a memoir do you think I don't, I don't think or so anything like that no I've no, no I've no desire to, 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 to do that no yeah I don't know why yeah well you know that's interesting um, you know, Roth mining his own life, of right. course, uh, allows him to not do extensive research. Right. You know, I mean, in some cases he might if he's writing about, you know, polio in the 1940s right. and that kind of thing. But your books, I mean, when I think of uh, a book like Zoli, the one that preceded Let the Great World Spin, and Let the Great World Spin, and the new book, um, you're covering a, a, an enormous epical landscape. Um, both in terms of geography and time, and of course in terms of all of the, these multiple characters, and uh, especially when I was reading Zoli, which is it's almost more like a, 
a long poetic portrait of someone. It's an on-the-road odyssey kind of a book that, um, uh, that's not a traditional novel right. in, in many, many ways. And uh, when I was reading, I thought, God, you know, obviously you had to spend some serious time uh, um, you know, researching the Romani people and traditions right. and going to the places where they are and talking to them. And I want to ask you about that. I wonder if you could tell us how, how that typically unfolds in your imagination. Like you get an idea, where do those ideas you know, come from? Are they, are they very instantaneous and, and, and uh, immediate or do they germinate for a while? Right. And then do you like go to the library for a year and then go on the road or does right. it all happen together? Are you writing at the same time as you're researching? If you could tell us a little bit about how you work. Yeah, it's a complicated stew. In relation to Zoli, which is a novel about a, um, you know, a gypsy woman in Slovakia, I mean, you can't get it much further than, than being an Irish male, <laughs> uh, and then you s suddenly become a gypsy poet living in, in Slovakia. Um, the idea came to me when I saw a photograph of this woman who'd been exiled uh, from the, the, the Romani people. And she, uh, she had such a startling, beautiful stare. Her name was Papushka. And she looked to me a bit like a, a, you know, a, a Russian poet, um, Anna Akhmatova. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, she's, and I couldn't get her out of my mind. And the only way to get her out of my mind was to sort of write her out of my mind. So I b began to imagine what a, a life of hers might have been. And then I started to write it. And then I, I went to the New York Public Library, yeah, uh, the greatest institution on earth. I love it there, <laughs> 42nd Street. Sure, yeah, I love going place. up those steps. But, um, and uh, spent it about a year. Uh, researching the Romani people and, and, and then went uh, continuing to write at the same time and then went to Slovakia to put a map on what my imagination had already presented me uh, and and that was when it sort of becomes fantastic for me because I spent a couple of months uh, and I went with Romani gypsy tour guides and, and people who translated for me but even they didn't want to go into some of the camps that I, I went bet, into yeah, yeah. and late at night well you know this you're a great singer uh, but I, I, I sort of negotiated my space by, I didn't have a, a translator with me, negotiate the space by, by uh, you know, Irish songs and, and, and stories and just like wandering around. Yeah, yeah. And Interesting. It was well, dangerous you know, though what, too. When, uh, getting back to the biographical angle, when I was reading the book, there's, uh, as I mentioned, it's a real kind of odyssey and, uh, and during the course of the novel, Zoli, the main character, uh, takes like you know, a, a very very long walk. I mean, she walks yeah. from like Slovakia to, to Italy. Italy, yeah. and uh, and there are other many arduous journeys there. And, and all of a sudden, I thought, oh yeah, one of the one of the well known facts about your real life is your eighteen month bike trip across the U.S. when right. you were you know very young, and and your very long walks in Ireland mm. and elsewhere. Yeah. And I thought, oh yeah, you know, I I'm borderline agoraphobic. You know, <laughs> I don't think I could write a convincing. Uh, you know, uh, um, passage like the one in, in, ones in Zoli about her her long hike. So yeah. there is a way, obviously, in which your real life experiences come into play in, sure. in the books. Yeah. I mean, I tell my students that, that people say um, that you should write about what you what, what you know about. Right. And I say, no, don't. You write towards what you want to know, or even write what you don't know. Ultimately, you can only ever write what you actually do uh, know. I mean, it's phys physically logically, philosophically impossible to write what you, what you don't know. But if you enter into that space where, where, where you're, you're embarking on, on, a, on a sort of journey, it becomes sort of uh, fantastic. And I like the idea of getting out and going. Like I walked from Dublin to Galway. I mean, people, when, when I was walking from Dublin to Galway, people would stop me and say, what's wrong with you, man? You know, there's a bus <laughs> down the road, you know? I also right. walked from, from Belfast to Kerry. Um, and that was, I, I, you know, still during the Troubles, actually, at, at, at that stage, in yeah. the Troubles in Northern mm -hmm. Ireland. But just to clear the head and, 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 and but I think, uh, I haven't done a long journey in quite a while, but I think my journeys happen on the page. So when I wrote Let the Great World Spin, and I sort of became, quote unquote, a 38-year-old hooker in, 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 in the Bronx, that to me is a form of investigation that's also a, a, a travel. You have to take that first step and step into the character and see if you can get to know that landscape, yeah, yeah. which is fun. Well, when, when, you're, um, uh, when you're deciding what kind of a book to write, you know, whether it's a book that, that uh, is about, uh, inspired by this, this poet whose photograph you saw, right. or Frederick Douglass's you know, journey to, to Ireland in, uh, during the time of the famine, 
Or do you ha is it one idea at a time? Or do you have like a file drawer with, you know, 60 potential Colin McCann novels I waiting wish. to be written? I wish if you can find that drawer for me. I, 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 no, generally I get obsessed by 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 by, um, by an idea. You know, this new novel, which is tr called Transatlantic. Um, you know, I was for years. I knew that Frederick Douglass had made a trip yeah. to Ireland in 1845, and I just couldn't get over it—a black slave landing in Ireland at the time of the famine. And I tried it, and I tried it, and I failed over and over and over again. You tried again. writing about it. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I threw it away, said I can't do it. Went on to something else. I kept coming back. It, it, it was almost like I had to, uh, I had to get it out of my system. Really? Yeah. And, um, yeah. It, it, he, he, he knocked me over quite a few times. Such an extraordinary character, yeah, too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so do, do you, do you um, write an outline? After you start, no, you know, I start. I start. Just start, start writing. from an image, and then and then see where it ends up. It's almost like you're 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 casting yourself out to sea. You're in you know a little boat, yeah. and you don't know where you're going to get. That's and right. most of the time, you know, you go like three or four yards, and the waves knock you back in. Yeah. You know that original journey, or you might go along the coast a little while, and then end up being blown back in by the wind. But occasionally, you'll get get out, and you'll find some Galapagos or some marvelous island that you didn't know that you were going to. Going to go there. But so I no as map. you're writing the book, you're you're discovering, you're discovering what discovering. the book is about. Yes, and yeah. even when you finish the book, that's the thing. I, I mean, I don't always know what a book is about. Even when it's finished, I I, I, I wait for other people to tell me what it's about because it's a deep yeah, sure. emotional yeah. response. It's like you, yeah. a, like a poem, yeah. right? When you yeah. write a poem, right. you don't really you, you operate on mystery, and mystery sort of ties these things together. But if you're too aware of what it is that you want to do, I think you become sort of polemical and you lose some of the, the magic and the characters don't surprise yeah. you as much. So you, it's a whole negative capability thing. Well, yeah, and yeah, I love to be surprised. Yeah, I love yeah. to, to, to surprise do, myself. Do these, do the books continue living in your mind after you've finished writing them? The funny thing the is with, with Zoli, um, I still believe that she finishes in, 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 in northern Italy and I still believe that I could go down uh, um, a little road and turn the corner and knock on the door and I'm quite convinced that she could she would open the door for me with the um, say some of the characters in Let the Great World Spin mm -hmm. um, that I that they are still there in the Bronx they're still still alive for me so mm -hmm. once they're created um, because I think you know the imagined is quite real sure and yeah. I love the idea say you know reading Ulysses um, that 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 uh, I can go back to Dublin and I can walk along the Strand and, and Bloom will be there or Daedalus will be there or even better my great-grandfather who was alive at the time right. will be yeah. there yeah. and this yeah. is the perfect thing about, sure. about writing books to sure. me yeah. because we, 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 we learn and we, and, and, and we discover in extraordinary ways. Well that ways. comes through in, in your novels I think that sense of, of things unfolding you know of the, the writing being very alive that this isn't sort of plotted out in advance. It's happening as you're reading it. Right. That you that really I think uh, gives the books a lot of their energy. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, you hope that the that that the reader goes on the same journey that 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 that, that you do. That they are just as surprised or d disappointed or as disheartened or you know even and and I think books are sort of radical in the sense that that they're they're almost acts of uh, of civil disobedience in a way uh, or certainly acts of of of, of nonviolence that you could you can read. A passage from a book and experience the the pain uh, of you know a character in, in a certain way, but you can come out of there so, sort of wounded, emotionally wounded, but you won't have any of the, any of the scars. And this is where stories and storytelling come in, and 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 where it really begins begins to matter because we we all have a need to tell each other a story. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And without the stories, we're yeah. you know we're we're just we're just dead meat. Yeah. Well, speaking of of the stories, I mean, let the great world spin. Um, just was enormously successful. I mean, it resonated with people uh, all over the world, um, uh, in part because it, it, it plays off a little bit on the World Trade Center attacks, right. although they're not the subject of, right. the, of the book at all. But, and that was wonderful, the way you, you sort of uh, um, uh, uh, took, took all of these different facets of life in New York and, and pulled them all together. I mean, as a native New Yorker, and a Bronxite, actually. Right. I was very, very much impressed with your recreation of the Bronx in the 70s with the Corrigan brothers, et cetera. Um, as I mentioned in the intro, it won all kinds of awards, and I'd like to have you read a passage from sure. it now, if you wouldn't mind. I'd be, I'd be delighted our to. viewers a sense of it. 
Um, you know, a funny thing happened to me. I gotta tell you, like, um, I, went, I went to do the recorded books. Um, I, I said, I suggested to them that, that, that I should do the recorded books and I could read for them. Yeah, yeah. And they said, well, would you come down for an audition? I said, <laughs> audition for my own book? And then and they said, yeah, can you come down? So I did, I went down to, for the audition and guess what? You didn't get it? I didn't get the job. <laughs> so be warned. Who did? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Somebody else got the, the, somebody else got the job. That's but uh, uh, I, lo I love to read. But this is a section I've never, I've never uh, read before. And this is where the women are together on, in a Park Avenue um, apartment on the day of Philippe Petit's tightrope walk. But they're um, mothers uh, of, uh, who have lost their sons in, in Vietnam. What man, says Gloria. Oh, the man who came here. Claire says, who's that? She picks a bagel from the sunflower bowl, looks up at the women. She pauses a moment, slices through the thick bread, pulls the rest of the bagel apart with her fingers. You mean the tightrope man was here? No, no, no. What man, Claire? She reaches across and pours the tea. The steam rises. She forgot to put out the slices of lemon. Another failure. The man who told me. What man? The man who told you what, Claire? You know, that man. And then, a sort of deep understanding. She sees it in their faces, quieter than rain, quieter than leaves. Uh-huh, says Gloria. And then, a loosening over the faces of the others. Mine was Thursday. Mike Jr.'s was Monday. Mike Clarence was Monday as well. Jason was Saturday, and Brandon was a Tuesday. I got a lousy telegram, 13 minutes past six, July the 12th, for Pete. For Pete, for Pete's sake. They all fall in line, and it feels right. It's what she wants to say. She holds the bagel at her mouth, but she will not eat. She has brought them back on track. They are returning to old mornings together. They will not move from this. This is what she wants. And yes, they are comfortable. And even Gloria reaches out now for one of the donuts, glazed and white, and takes a small, polite nibble and nods at Claire, as if to say, go ahead, tell us. Well, we got the call from downstairs, Solomon and I. We were sitting having dinner. All the lights were off. He's Jewish, you see. Glad to get that one out of the way. And he has candles everywhere. He's not strict, but sometimes he likes his little rituals. He calls me his honeybee sometimes. It started from an argument when he called me a wasp. Can you believe that? All of it coming out of her like grateful air from her lungs, smiles all around, befuddled, yet silence all the same. And then I opened the door. It was a sergeant. He was very deferent. I mean, he was nice to me. I knew right away, just from the look on his face, like one of those novelty masks, one of those cheap plastic ones, his face frozen inside it, hard brown eyes and a broad moustache. I said, come in. And he took off his hat. One of those hairstyles, short, parted down the middle, a little shock of white along his scalp. He sat right there. She nods over at Gloria and wishes she hadn't said that, but there's no taking it back. Gloria wipes at the seat, as if trying to take the stain of the man off. A little sliver of donut icing remains. Everything was so pure, I was standing in a painting. Yes, yes. He kept playing with his hat on his knee. Oh, mine did too. Shh. And then he just said, your son. Your son is past, ma'am. And I was thinking, past? Past where? What do you mean, Sergeant, he's past? He didn't tell me of any exam. Mercy. I was smiling at him. I couldn't make my face do anything else. Well, I just flat out wept, said Janet. Shh, says Jacqueline. I felt there was rushing steam going up inside me, right inside my spine. I could feel it hissing in my brain. Exactly. And then I just said, yes. That's all I said. Smiling still, the steam hissing and burning. I said, yes, Sergeant, and thank you. Oh, mercy me. He finished his tea. All of them looked now at their teacups. And I brought him to the door, and that was it. Yes. And Solomon took him down in the elevator, and I've never told anyone that story. Afterwards, my face hurt. I smiled so much. Isn't that terrible? No, no, of course not. It feels like I've waited my whole life to tell that story. Oh, Claire, I just can't believe that I smiled. Oh, that's a brilliant passage. I love Thank that. You. I've never that, read that before. That that whole, uh, I mean, that that was I thought a, a brilliant way of bringing these very disparate 
parts of New York together, right. you know, by by having a, a bunch of characters, all of who and grief. All we all we all yeah, shared yeah, grief, grief right. and 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 the the big thing was for me was to find a woman on Park Avenue. Like I've always written about the dispossessed before. I wrote a book called The Side of Brightness, where I lived with the homeless people mm -hmm. in the subway tunnels. Great we talked book. about Zoli yeah. and and. Yeah. But this time around, um, I found a woman who lived in 75th and Park Avenue in a penthouse, and I, and, and I tried to put flesh on, 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 on the idea that she's, that she's complicated and just as complicated yeah, as everyone else. Yeah, and, exactly. And, and oh, it's a very and, sympathetic portrait, very moving. Thank you. And I mean, as is so much in this book, um, it's, it's really a dynamite book. Um, we are starting to, to get down to the wire mm. already. <coughs> I had a million other things I wanted to talk about. Uh, I did want to mention how uh, how knocked out I was by the the short film uh, that that came out. I guess it was what about four four I or five. I always years ago? know when it came when it came out because yeah. on my fortieth birthday I went to the Oscars. Oh, God, so it's like and eight years so ago. So it's eight years ago. Wow. Yeah. And yeah, and I've got an Oscar nomination. Brilliant little film that's out there online. People right. can see it. But quickly. Let's uh, let's segue into the new book, Transatlantic, yeah. which is due out, I think, in the next month or two. Yeah, a couple of months. Uh, in the spring of 2013, and this is uh, uh, in in some ways characteristic of your books. It's a multi-voiced, you know, uh, mm -hmm. novel that that includes a lot of different characters in different time periods and right. and countries, mm -hmm. with a centerpiece. I get, I haven't unfortunately I haven't read it yet. I haven't seen. I haven't it. read it myself either. <laughs> <all right. laughs> But I know Frederick Douglass is, is yeah. a, you know, uh, a big part of it. But the the piece that I did see in the New Yorker in April mm. of 2012, uh, called Transatlantic, is about these two pilots who made the first. I mean, everyone thinks of Lindbergh, who right. made the first solo. Incredible. Trip, these guys made the first actual. Absolutely trip. incredible. Eight years before Lindbergh, they went in a, in, a, in a modified bomber, um, an open cockpit, 11,000 feet. From Newfoundland, Canada, Amazing. and then ditched in in in, um, in 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 Ireland in the bog in Ireland. Yeah, yeah. But they took Amazing. the war out of the plane. And I thought it was and and so this is just um, the, the 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 start um, when they when when they're about to take off. A strong wind attends takeoff, arriving from the west in uneven gusts. The fog has lifted, and the long range weather reports are good. No clouds. The initial wind velocity is worrying. We'll probably calm to about 20 knots. There will later be a good moon. They climb aboard to scattered cheers, secure their safety belts, check the instruments yet again. A quick salute from the starter. Contact! The swing of the starting handle. Alcock opens the throttle and brings both engines to full power. He signals for the wooden chocks to be pulled clear from the wheels. The mechanic leans down, ducks under the wings, armpits the chocks, steps back, throws them away. He raises both arms in the air, a cough of smoke from the engines, the propellers whirl, the vicar's vimy is pointed into the gale, a slight angle to the wind, uphill, go now, go. The incredible engine roar, the waft of warming oil, speed and lift, the trees loom in the distance, a drainage ditch challenges on the far side. They say nothing, no great Scott, no chin-up old sport, no blimey. They inch forward, lumbering into the wind. The weight of the plane rolls underneath them. She's heavy today, so much petrol to carry. Damnation. A hundred yards, a hundred and twenty, a hundred and seventy. We're moving too slow. A sort of aspic, the tightness of the cockpit, sweat accumulating behind their knees, a cold swell of air in their stomachs, the bumpy ground below, the lethal whims of the weather. The motors strike hard, the wingtips flex, the grass beneath them bends and tears. 250 yards, the plane rises a little and then sighs again, jarring the soil. Good God, Alcock, lift her! A line of dark pine trees stands at the end of the airfield, looming close, close, closer still. How many men have died this way? Pull her back, Jackie boy, skitter sideways, abort! Now, 300 yards, good Jesus! A gust of wind lifts the left wing and they tilt slightly right and then we are rising, Teddy, we are rising, look, a slow grade of upward and ever so faint lift of the soul, and the plane is a few feet in the air, nosing up, the wind whistling through the struts. How tall are those trees? Brown converts the pines to possible noise in his mind, the slap of bark, the tangle of pines. Hang on, hang on. They rise a little in their seats, as if that this might lighten the weight of the plane beneath them. Higher now. The sky beyond the trees is an oceanic thing. Lift it, Jackie. Lift it. 
for God's sake. Here come the trees. Here they come. Their scarves take first flight and then they hear the applause of the branches below. That was a little ticklish, Alcock roars across the noise. Oh, that's wonderful. It was, um, thank you. I, uh, I, I don't know if there are any more awards for you to win, but <clears throat> I'm sure Transatlantic will, will uh, be met with great acclaim. Looks I, like a wonderful book. Well, thank you. I, I think the, 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 the acclaim comes in all sorts of extraordinary ways. Like even people just, just, just reading the book. And I had something happen to me recently that I, I, that I have to mention. I'm due to go to, um, to Newton, Connecticut, where the, where the, um, oh, really? where the, the yeah. shooting occurred. Yeah. And they, they decided to read um, Let the Great World Spin for the high school seniors really? to, to talk about grace and recovery. Oh, and, wow. and, that, and that to me is better than yeah, yeah. Any, any series of, uh, of awards. You know what it's like when somebody yeah. reads your poems oh, and sure. somebody yeah. reads it and, and they, they get it. Yeah. That seems to me to be the great grace of no, the writing life. Unfortunately, nobody reads my poems. So oh, well, I read your poems. They're great poems. <laughs> um, I wanted to quick. We only have a minute left. I wanted to, of course, thank you for being here, thank and you. I wanted you to give us a very, very quick update on on what film possibilities might be coming out with any of your books, and also, real quick, little um, summary of your music. Uh, um, uh, activities. Oh, I'm doing some, some 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 music stuff with uh, Joe Henry and uh, and Lisa Hannigan. I always worked with uh, Joe, Joe Hurley, Hurley as well. Yeah, Joe Hurley, and, yeah, and jo yeah, yeah. Uh, is great. And I'm working with J.J. Abrams um, on adapting Let the Great World Spin for the big screen. Really? Uh, who knows? Don't hold your breath, but um, who knows? Maybe uh, maybe in a year or two. Uh, he has it, to do Star Trek first. Oh really? Yes. But it looks that like that little thing, Star like Wars, you yeah, know, Star, right. Star Trek, Star Wars. But it uh, looks like it's going to happen. It looks like it's going to happen. Really? Yeah, That's yeah, amazing. Which would be, it would be fantastic. Uh, who would play? Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm open. I'm open to all sorts of ideas. I love there's so many great Irish actors. Colin Farrell uh, would yeah. be amazing, yeah. or Michael Fassbinder. Yes, or Michael Fassbinder. That, he's in everything. There's a fellow yeah, called yeah. Daniel Day Lewis. I know, <laughs> have you ever heard of him? Yeah. He's yeah, sort of he on would the be periphery good. there. He now. Would be good. Yeah. No, yeah. He's I, yeah, yeah, that would be uh, fun to, to work out the casting for yeah. Let the Great World Spin. And, and uh, it's yeah, it's it's an extraordinary thing. But you know, you can't you can't count on it. You just got to go and, and and write the books and, and and hope that something good will come out in the film end. Colm, thanks so much for being here today. It was great talking with you, and we My want pleasure. to get you back uh, with sooner than 15 years. Sooner than 15 years, yeah, five years this time. Thank you all for watching Hoko Polizzo's Writing Life. My name is Terence Winch, and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>